Now, Bronwyn, our former colleagues, our leaders at the time, you and I were in Parliament together demanding uh, leadership from the Prime Minister as leftist types try to stop the middle income tax relief due this year. Surely it's got to go ahead. It has. I mean, this was a very big promise made by Albanese prior to the election. Well, he's managed to break quite a few already, like the $275 um, discount we were going to get on our electricity bills. But there are so many things yeah. that he's broken or been slippery about. And he's being slippery about these tax cuts. Oh, yes, there's no plan to change them. But you just watch him try and slip and slide. And he's got to be held to, in, in fact, make sure those, those tax cuts go ahead. We've already had the first and second tranche. This is the third tranche. Uh, and it's part of that overall plan to give back to people money that bracket creep in fact, does thieve out of people's pockets secretly. And that's why we've got such a high collection of personal income tax underpinning so much of the budget. So the tax cuts are, in fact, a break on government expenditure uh, and, a, and a break on government um, largesse. So it's very important that they go ahead. And I'm sure the coalition will be uh, holding them to account. I'm sure that even the, uh, the large bulk of journalists may well hold them to account because it was such a big issue in the lead up to the election. Yeah, it was pretty straightforward. And if both John Howard and Peter Costello have summed it up rather nicely, suggesting that it is in fact theft from people, uh, you know, paying too much tax is not the right way to run a country. Government knows, uh, doesn't know as well as you do about how to spend your money. Now, Keith, uh, you're a former cabinet minister and our national sovereignty relies very heavily on the free passage of cargo on the high seas. Uh, these attacks that we've been hearing about in the last 24 to 48 hours on shipping in the Red Sea, I think is an attack on Australia. And yet the Albanese government isn't standing up for us at all. They're squibbing this. Well, there's been, you know, lots of, uh, I say, excuses about why we're not providing support into the Red Sea in terms of the alliance that's there. But helicopter air support sounds like something the Australian Navy can do to me. Uh, and this is a really important trade route. Uh, it will mean an increase in costs for those who are choosing to go around the Cape. Uh, our exports, our imports, our products, it's our economy. Uh, I really think that we should be there providing support as requested by the United States. Sure. And if it wasn't so serious, Gary, you'd be saying, won't someone think of the climate? But it is serious. Uh, I mean, the additional fuel that you need, the additional costs for shipping, the additional costs for our businesses that are trying to export, we should absolutely be there. The Australian Navy, this is what they train for. They're not there to sit on the benches when it's game day, and it's game day right now. And I'm, I mean, Bronwyn, also, the point on all of that is the Americans asked us, how can we say no to them? They're just so important. And on top of that, you've got this hatred from the left is evident, as reports suggest anti-Jewish groups uh, are plotting to stop Israeli-owned ships. I mean, this madness has to be called out. Why isn't the Prime Minister standing up? Oh, you, you can give me an answer, I'm sure. <laughs> well, the, the, the problem is, the problem is he is just Albo the trot, you know, short for Trotskyite. He likes fighting Tories. That's, that's what he is. And in the 20 plus, 20 plus years I sat in that chamber, nobody ever said he was leadership material. And it's just been proven. And we're seeing all this anti-Semitic movement going on right now, simply because there is a failure of leadership at the top. Albanese is letting it occur. He's not coming out as a strong leader. He's not taking a strong stance. And to have people who are allegedly Australian citizens, uh, who we said uh, a few moments ago how important that citizenship ceremony is and how important it is to people when they become Australian citizens. Well, I'm afraid it's looking like some of them are looking like fifth columnists. They want to undermine this country, this nation. We want people to come here to be part of Australia, to stand for what we stand for, not to say we're a particular group who are going to undermine the sovereignty of the nation and pick on a particular group. Now, we know the numbers. Hey, hey. There are only 99,000 Jews in this country and there are 981,000 people of Muslim background. Now, most of those people are in Labour Party seats and the cowardice of this Prime Minister to put the interests of... Uh, making sure he's building up votes in those electorates and, and sacrificing the nation and the people in it and the things we believe in is just shameful. 
and it's got to be seen for what it is. So when we see that people are planning to stop uh, Jewish businesses or Jewish um, shipping lines, how different is that from what Hitler did in the lead up to Kristallnacht? Not very different at all. No, and the thing that distresses me is that we're a democracy, so we should back democracies every day of the week. I mean, Keith, in uh, the Chinese president uh, Xi, uh, he's sabre rattling now. Again, he's warning about all sorts of winds and, and, and waves happening in the Pacific. I mean, Taiwan, as you know, is the free democratic China. They have elections for everything from dog catcher up, fair dinkum. It has elections for its president in a few weeks. The Chinese on the mainland, they don't like that. Well, there's a lot going on in the world right now, Gary. It's the Middle East. You've got the issues with uh, China and Taiwan, obviously. Uh, and as you've said, there's a lot of sabre-rattling from the Chinese. Uh, and if you recall, uh, there was a disturbing endorsement of the Albanese government from China about their decision not to provide that support into the Red Sea with an Australian naval vessel. So, uh, you know, as a member of parliament, uh, as someone who's actually interested in this country, we need to be strong on these issues, not weak. We need to be providing support. Uh, there'll be a time somewhere in the future where we'll need support from our allies as they're asking for support from us right now. Uh, it's an interesting and difficult and dangerous time, uh, and I think Bronnie's got this spot on. We've got a weak Labor government who are only interested in their domestic benefits, not the national interest. Well, they said that Joe Biden went to the bunker. Well, Albo is clearly hunkered down on this. He's just hoping everyone will look at something else. Meanwhile, of course, the Cabinet papers from 2003 have been uh, released and there's been plenty of stuff written today. Bronwyn, John Howard, other senior leaders want the release, uh, you know, want the release of the national security minutes as well to back up some of the debate that was built around the Iraq war. They remain locked away. I suspect that there's bigger fish at play. The principle of releasing that National Security Committee of Cabinet documents may well be the principal point. But uh, as Robert Hill has been saying all day, uh, based on the information they had, they had to do what we had to do in 2003, which was to back America, back the UK and get into Iraq. Uh, should the national security information now be made public, Bronwyn? Um I don't think so. I, I think that the practice is that we release the Cabinet papers. Um, and if you recall that time, Gary, um, certainly I remember believing I that there were um, <laughs> weapons of mass dis destruction. I believe that, um, yep. that there was sufficient evidence around. Certainly there was a very close relationship between John Howard and George Bush Jr. because he had been in Washington when 9-11 happened and immediately offered assistance to, to, to the United States. Now, that, that close relationship um, has persevered for years, and I think there were a lot of discussions that went on between um, George Bush and John Howard and Tony Blair, for that matter. Uh, there were a lot of people mm. who were against, uh, particularly on the left, who were against going in, uh, there were a lot of people who said it was really payback for 9-11, perhaps it was. But there was still a solid belief that there were weapons of mass destruction. Whether or not they ever existed and were done away with, or whether or not Hussein wanted to build up the belief that they were there as to make him look a big, strong man, those things I don't know that we'll ever know. But at the end of the day, um, I think the decision was taken legitimately. Yeah, I remember having a conversation with John Howard before the decision and I said that the story I'm getting from people is if we're going to have conflict, have it over there, not in Australia. And I think that's kind of figured very strongly in John Howard's mind at that time. But backing our allies, our fellow democracies, our fellow old democracies made a heck of a lot of sense. Keith, uh, reports out of Victoria today. Now, I personally find this difficult to believe. But so many MPs, about a third of the Labor caucus, live a long way out of the electorate they represent, both economically and physically. I find this wrong. I think it's reasonable, to the best of your effort, you live in the patch that you stand up in Parliament for. Gary, you and I are going to disagree on this one. If they're 20k away, <laughs> where I come from, I drove a 60k round trip yesterday just to have pizza with a mate of mine down at, but down at the beach. It's really not that far. I mean, it's not like it's the member for Parramatta that lives in Bellevue on the northern beaches. 
Uh, and yeah, the boundaries change all the time. I mean, how big's a city electorate? 60, 80, 100 square kilometres? It's really not that big. I know it feels like a long way for the city bound, but for those of us who travel hours and hours and hours to do things in the regions in the bush, and, and this is the reason that we need diesel cars and cars that actually get you where you want to go, Gary. Uh, mate, to be honest, I'm not that worried about it. As long as they've got a connection, as long as they're not parachuted in, as long as it's not a Christina Keneally type, of, type approach, and look what happened there. Congratulations, Di Lee. Well done. She'll be another good member this year. Uh, <laughs> mate, it's one of those things. You get who you vote for. Yeah, true enough. All right, Keith, I'll take your point now. But before I let you go, I mean, what's your big predictions for the year ahead? Now, Bromman, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it from you first. What's your big prediction for the year ahead? It's going to become more and more apparent uh, that Australia has an energy crisis, and it's the biggest crisis that we face, and that the Labor Party's policies are going to show them to be a failure, and that the nuclear debate will become more and more important and that we will have to come to a decision that we need to keep our coal-fired power stations going until we can replace them with moderate-sized mm -hmm. nuclear reactors on the footprint of those coal-fired power stations. All right, good prediction. Keith, what's yours for 2024? Uh, unfortunately, I think it's more economic pain for the Australian people, higher taxes, higher cost of living, interest rate increases, more costs, uh, all based on Albanese government policies. And unfortunately, I think they're going to ignore the results of the referendum. $400 million, the people have said no. I think they'll very sneakily implement it anyway. A lot of those things were already underway. Uh, and I think in a very underhanded manner, we'll get the voice. Yeah, and $100 million is going to an oversight committee of Indigenous people along the Darling River, so it's already starting, I suspect. And later on in this hour, we'll talk to a 17-year-old who's really going to call it out when it comes to the nuclear debate.